Good morning. You got your Bible handy? Hopefully you do, as always. Want to have the sword ready to be unsheathed and brought to bear. And so why don't we open it up here to um, Acts chapter 19. Last time we were in the book of Acts, a few episodes back, we, uh, we, we came in contact with Apollos, somebody who was familiar with the baptism of John and the ministry of John the Baptist, but had very limited knowledge in regard to Christ. Uh, he preached much like John the Baptist did, proving uh, about the, some issues about the Christ, about the Messiah, but didn't really have an accurate knowledge of it. Uh, he was not as familiar. And so Priscilla and Aquila brought him up to speed, and he began, therefore, then from that point on to preach even more boldly and passionately, having a fuller knowledge of the fact that Messiah had come and Jesus was the Messiah and what he'd accomplished and all of that. Now, uh, we left Apollos, he went over to Corinth, which is an area that Paul had invested a year and a half in and then ultimately went on from Corinth and, as we'll see, goes uh, he goes into Ephesus. But we mentioned last time that um, when Paul talks about how some plant, others water, and those kinds of things, this is exactly what happened with Paul planting seeds, Apollos going there and watering and helping to uh, essentially picking up the ministry that Paul had left there in Corinth. Um, uh, unfortunately, in Corinth, uh, some division ultimately rose up, uh, even sort of with people even sort of taking sides when it came to being a uh, you know sort of of the Apostle Paul or of Apollos or of Christ and such. Uh, and Paul, of course, spoke to those divisions in the letter of 1 Corinthians that he wrote from Ephesus, where he's uh, where he's going now. So that being said, just to kind of build some transitional history there of what's going on, we now look at chapter 19, where it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul uh, passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is, Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. And there were about 12 men. Now, some things are made of the 12 men. You know, was it... Um, did it just happen to be 12 men or did Paul find 12 men sort of in concert with the idea of the 12 apostles? We don't really know, but, um, but, but we do know that that's sort of an eyewitness factoid that, uh, uh, that Luke includes here in his recording of the book of Acts. We see throughout the book, uh, there comes a point when Luke sort of joins the party and then he sort of steps in and out from time to time. We know this based on the way that he speaks in the first person or he talks about things that are happening when he's not part of it. Uh, and those kinds of things, but he includes that detail. And uh, but what's going on here? Well, uh, Paul goes to Ephesus again. This is where he would write First Corinthians. He would get word about some of the issues that they were dealing with, some of the questions that they had, some of the divisions that were forming, and he would write First Corinthians to speak to those things from Ephesus. Um, uh, but when he gets to Ephesus, he finds some disciples, some people that had come to. Um, to believe in some sense in Messiah, but we get the sense here that they had, again, much like Apollos did, kind of an incomplete knowledge. Now, how is that possible? We think of faith now, when somebody comes to faith now, we think of it in different terms than we probably can apply, uh, that we probably could even apply to the first century. For example, we have 20 centuries of developed and very now very fully developed theology on things like, um, you know, what the gospel is and who Jesus is and his dual nature is both God and man. We understand ideas like the Trinity and these kinds of things. These are ideas that are firmly rooted in scripture, but at this early stage are still sort of being heard of by many. They are um, becoming more deeply understood and that kind of thing. That would be the case for centuries to come in some respects. Now, I would say that the apostles had a clear sense of these things, but in terms of after the apostles, those who no longer were inspired, but were building our theology on those things that were written by the inspired apostles, um, you know, these things came to a deeper understanding over time. Well, here in the very first century, when the gospel was brand new, we're really only about a decade or so, maybe two decades from uh, from the time uh, of the events of the crucifixion and resurrection. And so um, 
you know, as people were going from, as apostles would go from town to town and begin to share the gospel, they would meet people and ask them what they understood or knew. It's not surprising that you'd find people that had sort of a, 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 you know, an incomplete understanding of what was going on. So Paul, of course, was glad to fill them in on that. And that's what we see happening here. Um, You know, they didn't receive the Holy Spirit because they didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. Now, in Acts chapter 5, Peter speaks of the Holy Spirit as being God. We see the theology of the Holy Spirit throughout the New Testament where we understand, based on the comprehensive view of what's going on or what's written, I should say, we understand the the idea of the person of the Holy Spirit within the divine triune nature of God. Uh, We understand that same position of Christ as part of the triune nature of God, though the incarnation, um, God now walks among men, and of course the Father being distinct as well. And so, We understand these things with all this history behind us. Lots and lots of great minds have come to bear on the teaching of Scripture. We've come to a better understanding and have better resources to help us understand the Scripture. And so these things we sort of take for granted. But in the first century, of course, this is just developing. It's, it's, I mean, the, the, the doctrines aren't becoming something different. The truths of them, I should say, are not morphing, but the understanding of them is becoming more uh, 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 heightened. And so that being said, Paul is helping them begin to understand. I guess I say all that because um, it's important that as we read the scripture, that we don't sort of read a 20th century um, sense of things into it, but that we appreciate and and allow for the, the fact that this is very early in, in the Gospels moving out to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so you're, it's, it shouldn't surprise us that we come across situations like this where Paul brings a more full knowledge. Of course, the benefit of our, our being where we are is that we have all of Paul's writings, uh, all the ones that the Holy Spirit wants us to have. We have, again, 20 centuries of wonderfully rich, robust study, debate, discussion, writing, speaking, all these wonderful resources to come understand these things. Uh, concordances, uh, word study resources, and things like this. So, um, you know, again, it's, it's just it's helpful not to sort of assume that in the first century they had the kind of plethora of resource that we have today. They didn't. They had an apostle that came to town, and he would fill them in. And so um, it's, uh, it's a very different kind of a scenario. So we see conversations like this. It shouldn't really actually surprise us. But uh, again, so they were baptized into John's baptism, which Paul goes on to explain was a baptism of repentance. And the ministry of John the Baptist, as we understand it from the Gospels and also uh, from when it is spoken of later, like here, that the ministry of John the Baptist was that of a forerunner. Uh, Malachi, we see this, and the idea that there's one who is coming to proclaim the coming one in that. And that's what John the Baptist was. And so when he was out doing his ministry, his message primarily was make make way for the coming of the Lord, make his path straight, clear off those things that would prohibit the Messiah from coming and having free and open access, not just to town, but to the very hearts, uh, to our hearts. And so uh, because that was his ministry, it was by definition a ministry that was leading to something else. And that's what Paul begins to help them understand. He spoke about the coming of Christ. Well, now Christ has come and no doubt even though we only have a couple of sentences here in regard to the way that Paul spoke about these things in Ephesus, we actually later in chapter 20 come to realize that he has invested quite a bit in these elders over these cities. We realize from the, from the letter to the Ephesians that, he's, that, that you know, he has spoken to a, a, gr- a great many things with the Ephesians. Uh, we find out historically that Timothy ends up ultimately... Uh, pastoring uh, over these churches and giving leadership to these churches. Uh, We know from history later on, John the Apostle would spend time in Ephesus as well. And so Ephesus is a city where much was invested in. As a matter of fact, we read about, uh, we read uh, Jesus' own letter to the church at Ephesus uh, in the letters to the seven churches in Revelation. So Ephesus is a prominent fellowship uh, here in the New Testament. Here in chapter 19, we begin to see that ministry unfolding. So, Um, They were baptized into John's baptism. They had not yet heard of the Holy Spirit. Paul explains the gospel to them more fully. They come to believe and they're baptized. They are now what we would consider to be New Testament Christians, believers. They have come to trust in Jesus, the Messiah. Uh, They've been baptized. And Paul then lays hands on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. So not only has Paul no doubt explained the person of the Holy Spirit to them, but he has now actually prayed that they might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In other words, that the Holy Spirit might not just simply dwell in them, 
uh, Ephesians 1.13, the idea of him being the seal of our guarantee of our uh, of the inheritance that we are for Christ, but also that they might receive giftings. Uh, in his letter to the Corinthians in chapters 12, uh, 12, 13, and 14, 13 is kind of the love chapter, but it's well-placed between chapters 12 and 14 in, in, in uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, um, as the motivator for the use of the gifts. But in chapter 14, he talks, or chapter 12, he talks about the Holy Spirit distributing gifts as he wills. And so here, Paul is praying that they might receive the Holy Spirit as well. And as a matter of fact, they do receive the Holy Spirit, and an evidence of that happening is that they begin to speak in tongues. Now, you can read uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. 12 and 14 in particular talks about the gifts particularly. But you can read about the gifts there where um, it explains how the gift of tongues is to be used, what it is, what it isn't. You know, we, we come to understand both what it is and what it isn't from Paul's discussion on these things. But they begin to speak in tongues, which means they begin to speak in languages that they had no prior knowledge of. And we understand from the book of Acts chapter 2, Paul's discussion in 1 Corinthians, that the gift of tongues is not a language that you would have conversations with other people in, in languages that you did not know. After all, why would that be? What sense would that make? But if you couldn't understand what you're saying to each other, but it is actually a language that is used and given as a gift to praise God and to proclaim his great works as, as sort of a, a, a worshipful kind of a thing. Uh, we see that in Acts chapter 2. As a matter of fact, let's turn to Acts chapter 2. And uh, see the New Testament uh, introduction of this. Um, in uh, chapter 2, when the apostles are, have met in the upper room, they're waiting, as Jesus told them to, to be endued with power from on high. And in chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. About 120 of them, actually, as we read the passages, we find out. Uh, there appeared to them uh, as tongues of fire, uh, distributing themselves, and they rested on each and one, each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Remember, the Holy Spirit was giving them the gift and giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished and saying, were these not Galileans and that? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we're born? And then they go on to name all these different nations that are represented there. So we see that they are speaking the wonderful things of God, they're worshiping, they're praising God, and they're doing it in languages that they did not have prior knowledge of, and the people who are there are hearing them, and these people from these different countries recognize that these are Galileans, whether by appearance or maybe in the way they were speaking in tongues, you could still catch a hint of their dialects or something like that, but they could tell they were Galileans, and this was a strange thing to them. How is it the Galileans are speaking in all these different languages? This was a gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's what's happening back here in Acts chapter 19. They are speaking, presumably, there's no reason to think otherwise, they're speaking much like the apostles did in that first uh, encounter with the Holy Spirit in this way. And so, uh, now this was an evidence of the fact that the Holy Spirit had come upon them. Now, I should point out that it's not the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, um, you know, a lot of weight is given to the idea that when someone is baptized in the Holy Spirit, they speak in tongues. That is an automatic and, in, in the minds of some, a, a necessary um, expression or evidence that the Holy Spirit has indeed come upon somebody. Um, that's clearly not the case. Uh, we've, we've mentioned it a couple of times. Why don't we turn to 1 Corinthians, and uh, we'll look here at um, chapter 14, and we'll see here what Paul has to say in regard to this gift. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, um, uh, let me see here, let me go toward the end. Uh, here we go. I didn't actually expect to go here this morning, but it was on my mind, so I figured we probably should. So, oh, here we go. At the end of chapter 12, forgive me. Um, so he goes on and speaks here about um, sort of the gifts and the offices and things like that that are given by the Lord. Verse 29, uh, he goes on, or verse 28, let's start there. Uh, well, let's go to verse 27. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, 
Uh, then miracles and gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. Um, are uh, All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healings, do they? All do not have uh, all do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the greater gifts, and behold, I show you a more excellent way. And then he begins to speak about love as the central feature of the Christian's life that should undergird the use of any of the gifts. But he asks a series of rhetorical questions at the end of that discussion there. He talks about the various gifts and distributions that the Holy Spirit gives. And then he goes on and says, well, not everybody has all these things, right? I mean, not everybody's an apostle, not everyone's a prophet, not everyone speaks in tongues or interprets, do they? The implication being that, no, the answer is no, of course not everybody speaks in tongues. Well, then how can tongues be the sign of being filled with the Holy Spirit or being baptized by the Holy Spirit, whatever various terminology you might want to to use for that. The idea that the Holy Spirit as a secondary thing, he indwells us as believers. That is true of every believer. But the idea of the Holy Spirit coming upon a believer for acts of service or to be used by him in some way or for whatever purpose he might uh, bestow a gift or something. But the idea is that tongues is not a gift that every believer has. I, for example, don't speak in tongues. I believe the gift is around today, and I, I believe there have been legitimate expressions of it in our day, but I don't have that gift. One of the ways you know if there's a legitimate expression is if there's an interpretation that comes with it. Uh, somebody speaks in a tongue, someone else interprets, there's some validating of, of that use of the gift in that context. Um, but it's it's not supposed to be the premier gift. It's not supposed to be seen, I should say, as the premier gift. It's not the only evidence of the Holy Spirit's uh, baptism. It's, it's also uh, by no means expected to be even a expression of the believer's baptism in everybody's life. Uh, some believers never experienced that. I've never spoken in a tongue, um, but you know, there's other giftings the Lord has given me, just like he's given you. And so... Anyway, so uh, just a brief little kind of detour to talk about the gift of tongues. We have spent more time talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. If you want to hop on uh, my my website at parsonspad.com, you can actually find uh, studies on the Holy Spirit where we talk about these things in greater detail. But that's coming back to Acts chapter 19. That's what's going on here. So they begin to speak in tongues. um, And again, they were about and prophesying. Now we say prophesying. I, I should take a minute on that too. I should just blow by that. Um, When we talk about prophesying, um, this is another gift that oftentimes is somewhat controversial in the minds of many. Um, Spoiler alert, in the interest of transparency, I do believe this is a gift that still exists, but let me explain what I mean by that. Um, There are those that believe that God gives prophecy that is on par or equal to inspired scripture. That is not true. The canon of scripture is closed. If someone gives a new prophecy... Uh, We judge that prophecy based on what the scriptures say. And so, you know, no one's getting new scripture today. Uh, But does God still speak today? That's another question. Well, some would say no, because if he was speaking, that would be the same thing as saying scripture. Because if God's giving a word, then why why wouldn't we consider inspired scripture then or something, you know? So the argument along that way, I'm being a little bit simplistic about it, but there's a basic argument that that, uh, against the idea based on that kind of thing. Well, the answer to that is that there are places in Scripture where people prophesy, but there's no nothing, there's no uh, record of what they said. And so the fact that they prophesied is considered part of inspired Scripture, but what they said was clearly not part of inspired Scripture because it was not included in Scripture. So this being one of those cases, uh, Philip's daughters who were prophetesses, they prophesied, but we have no idea what they said. Uh, And so, you know, the mention of those having the gift and what they said are actually two different things. If uh, we had, if there was a record of what they said, then that would be considered part of scripture if it was in in fact included in it. But the canon of scripture is closed. And so in the same way that somebody might have a gift of prophecy today, in other words, um, if I were teaching something and I went on one of my typical detours, but it turned out that something within that detour spoke to you very specifically about something in your life that was maybe an answer to prayer that you were wondering or a direction or um, maybe there was something, you know, um, along those lines, then maybe God would have given in that moment a gift of prophecy to speak to something like that. Or maybe I said something that, you know, whether I, you know, I wasn't intentionally trying to prophesy, 
but maybe something came to pass that I surmised or whatever about something. That, not that that is always prophecy. But if it did happen that way, that would be an example of, of the gift in action. Or maybe you're praying with somebody and the Lord puts a word on your heart and says, you know, this person's going to be in this place or that place or get this job or, or something like that. Just, I'm just off the top of my head. And it comes to pass. Well, praise the Lord. Maybe that was, in fact, a word of prophecy. Um, the fact is we don't often know whether or not a gift is a legit gift until we see the fruit of it. Um, there was, for example, I, I probably shared this before, but years and years and years ago when I was a young worship leader at Earl Church in Illinois, um, there was a guy that showed up from Hawaii. And uh, he was there on one of our, I think it was our midweek service or something, or maybe it was Sunday night or something like that. But after worship, and I was a young worship leader, and I was very non-confident I you know I was you know just I was just growing and learning into the part and so but he came up after service one day uh, one of those studies and he said hey I just want to let you know something you know God gives me words of prophecy and I just want to tell you that your ministry is going to be heard around the world like you're going to write songs that people are going to be singing around the world now that was a, almost 30 years ago you're probably not singing any of my songs. I'm not a prolific songwriter. I've never written anything that's really gone anywhere or anything like that. So I would say that whether or not this guy had been given words of prophecy at some point, that one really wasn't. And so um, not everything that purports to be a gift of prophecy necessarily is, you know. So, um, uh, so, the, so that being said, the gift, I think, still exists because there is no biblical reason. You can't point to a scripture and say, here's my case why there is no more prophecy. But we also should not just automatically assume that anyone who says they've got a gift of prophecy necessarily does. We should always discriminate. Even as Paul says, you know, let two or three speak, let the others judge. So that's how we utilize that gift. But here in chapter 19, uh, in Ephesus, as Paul laid hands on these new believers, uh, they began to speak in tongues and to prophesy, and the Holy Spirit evidently uh, uh, had a legit, they had a legitimate experience with the Holy Spirit there. Again, there were about twelve men in all. Uh, verse eight, and he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way, which is the name that the church was known by in some quarters, before the people. He uh, uh, withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. So as he's in Ephesus, he faces opposition. He speaks about this in 1 Corinthians 15, where he talks about if there's no resurrection and we have no real hope or anything, then why would I endure these, these, these animals trying to, you know, these ravenous wolves trying to come in, or these dogs or the term that he uses, but he speaks of this idea of them coming after him for preaching these things. And he uses it as sort of an evidence like, well, why would I do that if there was no resurrection in that? Well, this is likely what he's referring to as the opposition he was facing here that we read about in verse 9. Um, so as he's sharing the truth about the kingdom, he is people are coming to Christ. He's sharing the gospel. He's sharing news about the kingdom. Um, and, and by the way, the kingdom is a very important thing for us to understand. The kingdom um, primarily speaks of the idea of the millennial kingdom, the, the reign of Christ, his return to establish his kingdom in that. That's, that's what the term speaks of. Now, whether Paul went beyond that to speak about eternity in that, we don't know. But here, at, at this, uh, you know, in the church's early history, one of the great things that was looked forward to was the idea of Christ's coming to establish his kingdom. Uh, and so in a, in a society that was overrun by Roman rule, that would be a hopeful message, a wonderfully hopeful message. And so Paul includes that in his preaching and teaching. However, he did face opposition, uh, whether it be by the Judaizers or the town folk that had vested interest in other gods and goddesses. Uh, you know that uh, in, in, in Ephesus, there was the temple of, of Diana or Artemis. Uh, who was worshipped uh, as as a as a as a big hitting deity and all this, and so he faced a lot of opposition for sharing the teachings that he was sharing. But he did it nonetheless, even in spite of that persecution. But there came a point when it got to be so heavy that he didn't stop, but he just moved to a different location, and it was this place called the School of Tyrannus. Now, there's not a lot known about the School of Tyrannus except that it was apparently named after somebody who uh, existed a, f a couple hundred years prior to this time 
And so some have surmised this is a school of philosophy, or maybe there's, uh, it just was a school where different kinds of ideas were taught. Um, it, it likely was not a school like multiple classrooms so much as it was a place of oratory, and different orator, orators would come and speak. Forgive me for the analogy, but something like a TED Talk, you know, something where you'd have a, a platform where people would come and speak on different topics, and there would be interlocutors as people would go back and forth with ideas and discuss and debate things. Well, Paul went to go teach there on these things because in this forum, that was kind of accepted because it's a forum for learning. Uh, and so that's generally the thinking about the school of Tyrannus. And so Paul goes there and he begins to teach. Now, this went on for two years that he was teaching there in verse 10, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and and Greeks. Again, likely at least in part because the school of Tyrannus may have had some uh, notoriety as a place to come and hear these ideas, much like Mars Hill in Athens. You know, people there would come to hear different philosophies and to learn any new ideas that were coming through. School of Tyrannus, somewhat similarly. And so, um, anyway, so Paul continues to take these opportunities to bring the truth of God forward. Now, as we continue through uh, the next passages next time, we're going to see him continuing his ministry in Ephesus. And when we get to chapter 20, we're going to see that before he departs from Ephesus, he pulls the leaders of the churches in the region there in Ephesus together, and he warns them about wolves coming in to not sparing the flock, but to basically to, uh, to, to, uh, to devour the sheep and that, those who are being poured into as young believers, not unlike these that Paul met when he first came to town. Um, this is the heart of a pastor uh, burdened deeply for the health and well-being of the sheep. And this, this of course, is the underlying reason why Paul would write so many letters and, and would write to these churches that he spent time with, or even churches that he hadn't been with, but wanted to see, or at least wanted to pour into that they might be strong in their faith. So, um, so one of the beautiful benefits as we wrap up today, one of the great benefits of going through the book of Acts is that it really puts flesh and blood to so much of the theology we read about in the New Testament. Uh, if we just had the epistles, we would have these, of course, these wonderfully rich, spirit-inspired uh, teachings on the Christian faith and on, on orthodoxy and orthopraxy and all these different ideas. But the book of Acts actually puts us in the places where these believers that were written to in the epistles uh, came to faith and what their faith was like and what they were like in the cities they were in and the kinds of philosophies that may have existed. Again, it just sort of puts flesh and blood to the theology that we read. And I think that's really, really important because it keeps it from sort of, it keeps our theology from sort of being in a vacuum where it's somehow separated from uh, from the people that it was uh, expressed to, the people as they learned it and those kinds of things. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, it's somewhat almost like kind of biographical of the times and those kinds of things. So it's just a, a very rich way to sort of come to become familiar with some of the things that Paul would write about uh, later. And so, all right, well, we're going to stop there for today. We'll pick up in Acts chapter 19 uh, again, uh, whether tomorrow or the next day or, you know, sometime soon we'll come back to it. I will say, though, um, I am... Uh, I asked earlier for prayer about starting the book of Romans, and I think we are going to start it very, very soon. I, I thought about waiting till we finish the book of Acts, but the way we approach the podcast, where we sort of, you know, we sort of come and go with, with, with our studies and we intersperse, you know, prophecy updates or various topical kinds of things, um, you know, it's, uh, it's not like we're doing like these side-by-side -side in depth studies on things. So it's not too difficult to do that, but um, I'm thinking I might go ahead and start Romans uh, in the in the soon coming days. So I would just ask you to continue to pray for that because uh, Romans is such a fundamentally important theological treatise in the New Testament. Uh, Paul's treatment of the gospel in the book of Romans is absolutely breathtaking. And so we're going to um, really take our time and make our way through it. That's actually why we're doing it on the podcast and not like on Wednesday nights or Sunday mornings where we just do one study a week on it. Uh, we might string a few days together here and there as we make our way through things uh, as you know, as we're led and just make our way through it. But, um, but it's, uh, this is a study that you'll want to read the book of Romans on your own. You'll want to read it a couple of times. When we make our way through it, you're going to want to have your notebook out so you can cross-reference things and stuff like that. 
We're going to let, uh, really kind of try and let the passages breathe and talk about them in some length. We're not going to race through it, um, but uh, we're going to take our time in Romans. And so, uh, boy, I'm so excited about that. Um, I, I uh, So w- that'll be soon. Whether it's this week or next, we'll probably start our first study in it. So ask you to pray for that. Uh, regarding other things that we're doing, by the way, if you're uh, so inclined and want to follow any of our other studies, we're also doing the book of Jude on Wednesday nights. We just started that last week. And uh, our Wednesday night podcast uh, is something you can tune into. And of course, Sunday mornings, we're doing um, uh, the, the book of Revelation as well. So uh, lots of opportunities to get into the word. And so we encourage you to um, to do that when you're able. So praise the Lord. Thanks for watching. I, it's, it's so nice that we can be going through the word together. And, uh, and growing in our faith together, especially again, as I always say, in these days, like we are, I'm looking out the window like these days are coming through my window or something. But um, when you consider the world we're living in, we are not we are not long for seeing the Lord. And so to to spend time talking about prophecy and that is so important to help us understand the times in which we live. But to spend time in the Word and going through like Acts or the Epistles or the Gospels or really any part of the Word of God. Old or New Testament, where we come to know God better and better and better, uh, that cannot be uh, that cannot be overstated. The importance of that, because one day when we see Him face to face, the less of a stranger He is when we meet Him, the better. And so that's why we go through the Word, that our hearts might know Him well. So, that being said, thanks for joining, Father. We thank you for time in Your Word. We thank you that. Uh, Father, you've given your word to, to regular folks like us to read it, to study it, to come to understand it, to, um, to live it out. So help us to not only understand in our minds, but to believe and trust in our hearts and to walk it out uh, with our feet, to live it out uh, each day. Father, we pray that uh, the knowledge of you that we gain through your word would have profound changing impact on us. Help us to become truly, by the power of the Holy Spirit as he works in our hearts, help us to become more like Jesus, for his glory's sake, for his name's sake, so that when people look at us, they see our lives, they would recognize that we're disciples. Uh, Father, they would see that we're followers of Jesus in the way that we talk, the way we see the world, the way we interact, the way we love one another, uh, the way we uh, seek the lost, the way that uh, really you live your life out through us. Uh, Father, we thank you that uh, your word has the power to cleanse us and to wash us from the inside out. It certainly never returns void and it it accomplishes the thing you set it forth to do. And so our desire is that you send it forth into our hearts that it would find fertile ground and it would hit its mark and bring growth and not find resistance or an opposition to it. Help us not to keep you or your word at arm's length. Help us to avail ourselves to you and to your word that it would, and that you would through it change us again to make us more like Jesus. Father, we thank you and praise you for this time, and we ask you to just go ahead and and have your way in us, Father, both in this day and in the days to come, until one day Jesus comes to get us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.